I have received grant support and have participated in advisory meetings from Gilead, MSD, and Beef Healthcare. So uh, we will discuss, we will talk about a single case, but I think uh, Jonathan warned me not to extend it too much because he says we could be talking about the whole day. But anyhow, so this is a 32-year-old uh, Western European male who is an MSM and occasionally practices chem sex. He has had several treatments for syphilis and chlamydia. And nowadays, he doesn't have PrEP available in his country, but this is going to be the first trick. I'm going to change that in the middle of the presentation so you are aware of that but as of today he doesn't have prep available and then he was tested essentially because his partner was diagnosed with HIV infection and he feels well he has no symptoms at, at diagnosis so yeah on his first uh, blood test he has 462 uh, CD4 counts not too low, and a reasonable uh, viral load, 78,000 copies per email. His Hep B and Hep C negative, his HLA B5701 is negative, he has residual titers of an RPR uh, serology, normal blood counts, liver and renal function, so we would say, let's say an easy case, okay, so, so let's treat him, right? So I will just, this will be an informal, informal uh, voting process. So which of the following is for you a suboptimal first line antiretroviral treatment option? So you can just raise your hands quickly. So number one, no one, number two, number three, abacavir, uh, 3TC dolutegravir, number four, who thinks number four is a suboptimal option? Sorry, for first line in this patient, only two, three, and, and number six, number five. I think that number number five is tenofovir XTC fibrins. We can go back to number four is 3TC dolutegravir. Okay, so you guys are optimistic. <laughs> And the sixth option is none. There's no suboptimal first line antiretroviral therapy in this patient. Who votes for that? So, okay, a few, a few hands. Okay, so, so a little trick is about suboptimal. It's really like calling things suboptimal is a little bit too harsh. So probably we're not there. What we, we don't consider really treatments to be necessarily suboptimal, but what we do is we recommend some regimens and then we have some alternative, uh, alternative regimens. It is pretty clear that according to the EX guidelines, a recommended regime would include TAF or tenofovir plus FTC plus dolutegravir, raltegravir, rilpivirin, or the Runevir, uh, boosted the Runevir, <coughs> or uh, Triomec, essentially, okay? So all the other options are alternative, so they don't, they're not called suboptimal, they're just called alternative, but nowadays, like, DTG plus 3TC is considered an alternative option, just as uh, Tenofibir FTC uh, efavirenz. Similar uh, findings in the DHSS guidelines. And of course, there's a lot of discussion on whether we should change that or not. And I, I hope that this case will illustrate where are we now. And, and uh, I have to advance that we don't have uh, answers, but uh, I just want you to think about things. Okay, so let's assume that this, as we said, a PrEP is not available in his country. So I would say this is a, a patient that has been recently, well, has recently been diagnosed, no big uh, clinical problems. So would you do a resistance test before um, starting antiretroviral therapy? Who would vote for number one? Yes, always. Okay. Who would vote for number two? So no, I would first start antiretroviral therapy, order a resistance test, and review the resistance test results uh, later. Who? Okay, two, three. This is actually what is being done in many clinics. Uh, so, so, so it is interesting. So, the third option is resistance tests are useless because there's almost no transmitted resistance. Has anybody? I would say that's an naysayer. Uh, option. And then number four is resistance tests are useless because drugs work so well that they are able to suppress transmitted drug resistance viruses. No, that's the optimistic, the super optimistic option. And someone would vote for two and four. 
Not really. So most of you are uh, assuming that you would do a resistance test always in any situation uh, and, and a few of you would start therapy and then order the resistance test and review the results. Okay, and then a second question. You're doing a resistance test essentially, I mean for clinical purposes, we're talking for clinical purposes, not for surveillance. Essentially because you expect this resistance test to tell you something about the treatment and to help you construct the first line therapy. So, in other words, you're expecting to see some, you want to know if there's some resistance. Uh, so which resistance would, be, would you be waiting for? What would you be expecting here? So who would vote for resistance to XTC? If you to tenofovir, who would be expecting resistance to tenofovir to XTC and tenofovir? People are not answering, really. So, are you expecting resistance to the NSTIs? NNRTIs? A lot of people waiting for NNRTIs, okay. Boosted PIs? And anyone who says, I'm not scared, bring them on? <laughs> no, that's David. <laughs> okay. So yes, so there is resistance, there is transmitted resistance around the world uh, and, and, and of course a lot of us have done research on that and, and there is also transmitted resistance in, in, in Europe but when we look at the, how this transmitted resistance is actually affecting our first line therapies, the first line therapies that we have nowadays in, in, in our clinics, it actually happens that the, here in the, this is some data from Denmark, uh, we can uh, present data from other parts of the world. So you could see that less than 1% of viruses have some compromise to the boosted PIs, that, so it's really minimal. And in many cases, um, these are associated to transmission clusters, which tell you that you need to know the, your local epidemiology and know if there are a transmission clusters. For example, in the Netherlands, there are some transmission clusters in the not in the PIs. I think it's it's a 41L and, and others. Same thing, more resistance to the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. But as you can see here, less than two percent of, of patients in Denmark have uh, potentially compromised uh, their NNRTIs. And, um, for, uh, Sorry, for up to 4%, and then very little resistance to the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Some data from, from Italy, graciously shared by Carlo uh, with me, shows you again that uh, between 7 to 10% transmission of, of resistance, in many cases in, in, in B subtypes, less frequently in non B subtypes, but when you look at the prevalence, for example, of, I hope you see. Yeah, M1 it for V, for example, which is uh, well, the mutation we're talking about these days, is really, is really, is really infrequent. It's, it's, it's less than 0.2% of, of viruses should have these mutations. So in a patient who has not been exposed to PrEP, uh, it is very unlikely that this patient is going to have an M1 it for V. In this context, and then if we consider uh, the currently available treatments, like particularly second generation in STIs, so both the Alutegravir and Bictegravir, um, it is becoming more evident that uh, it, it is really non-cost effective to, to do a baseline resistance test. And I guess that saying this here could imply that I could get shot. Uh, I hope not. But anyhow, this is food for thought for you to, to think about it. I mean, in this recent analysis from uh, Rochelle Balensky's group, uh, the situation, uh, it would be really difficult in the presence of INSTI, uh, Bictegravir and uh, uh, it is it it's going to be very difficult to find that a baseline resistance test is cost effective, okay? And they're very uh, strong on, on, on that. Um, and of course, this is food for discussion afterwards. So whether uh, cost effectiveness should be the only reason why we choose these tests or whether there are other uh, consequences in the, in, the, in the future. But this is what we have. But now trick number one. Uh, we changed the story and it turns out that we are now in, finally in Barcelona and, and PrEP was accepted and now the Catalan government is providing, uh, the Spanish government is providing PrEP to, to people. So, and this guy was infected and he tells you that he had been exposed to PrEP in the past. So would you be afraid of, of, of transmitted uh, resistance or uh, PDR. So option one, no. Clinical trials showed that resistance selection during PrEP is negligible. Who would vote for, for this one? 
Option two, yes, but rates of PDR are very low. I would start uh, antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, order a resistance test and review resistance test results later. So we have a few, a few more, okay. And three, yes, rates of PDR are high. After PrEP, I would wait to, uh, to the resistance test before I start antiretroviral therapy. Okay, so I would say split between two and, and three. And then, if Joe was taking PrEP with Tenofovir and FTC, which might not be the case in the future, but this is the most frequent uh, PrEP uh, regimen that we will that he might be taking, which of the drugs on a first-line uh, regimen could be compromised? So, who votes for none? Who votes for XTC? Who votes for Tenofovir? Could be. Could be. Who votes for both XTC and Tenofovir? And who votes also for Insti-Eyes? Nah, Insti-Eyes, he hasn't taken Insti-Eyes, right? <laughs> That's just for fooling you. Okay, so we have very interesting data from, from New York City uh, that was presented recently in at Croy, showing that up to 30% of, of new HIV infections in New York City that had been exposed uh, to PrEP in the past had actually transmitted uh, resistance. And it, it was essentially all of them were m 1 for v okay? There was almost no uh, K65 far. They were actually, we were able to find four uh, only cases of, uh, sorry? Subtype it's subtype B, most of them are subtype B. Yes, this is the data we have, eh? okay? So I'm sure we shows you the importance of generating this data outside clinical trials. These are people who have been exposed, who have been on, off, on, off, so it's, it's uncontrolled, it's outside clinical trials, but this is what you should expect, I guess, at least we should be expecting in many of our cities. It's like, yeah, well, a certain amount of people might have selected an M1 for V mutation. Either because there were, they started PrEP during uh, acute HIV infection, and they were not properly diagnosed, and then they were exposed to, to, to uh, XTC uh, uh, during, during PrEP, or maybe because compliance in real life is maybe not that good, maybe there are non offs whatever, but the, the populational data are 30% of new HIV infections uh, in New York have m 4 v so, uh, what you, would be your first antiretroviral choice if you suspect pre-existing m 184 v Would it be number one, TAF, FTC, Bictegravir, so Bictarvi, the guys at Gilead should vote, <laughs> at least. So TAF, FTC, the Runevir, 3TC. Would anyone uh, vote for number three? Number three? And uh, Crystal, I will, Ask you afterwards, and then uh, uh, would anyone anyone vote for three uh, three TCW tegravir in this situation? Not not really. What is happening in the clinics, and maybe this is food for discussion afterwards, is that when we have this suspicion, we tend to provide four drugs instead of three because we are scared of the genetic barrier, right? We want to ensure genetic barrier, but there's preliminary data from uh, triple drug uh, triple drug regimens with, well, there's data with, with uh, pr uh, triple drug regimens with both Bictegravir and Dolutegravir that are very promising and suggest that maybe these regimens would be would be enough, but this is an area that, that, that we need to explore because it has important costs and I think we will be seeing more and more of this situation in the clinic. No one uh, today would, would, would vote for 3 tct dolutegravir as of, uh, based on what we know nowadays. So, in summary, it depends on it being oversimplifying the situation, and sorry about that. It all depends on whether we have INSTIs available or not. So, if dolutegravir or Bictegravir are available for first-line uh, treatment, we essentially worry about them when it for V. E, and, and this is what's carrying most of the clinical discussions these days, whether the patient has m for v or not. We're not really expecting a lot of K65R being transmitted uh, these days, and we don't see it a lot uh, after the PrEP uh, uh, exposure. And, and we, if we live in a place where there are no dolutegravir or pictegravir available, then of course we worry about NRTI, drug resistance mutations, as well as m for v 
M184 V. So we know that M184 V uh, uh, is a cause of resistance. It's, it, it is selected quickly after exposure to to 3TC and, and, and XTC. Thanks to Vincent uh, Calves who shared these slides also with, with me uh, recently. Uh, also, but m 4 b also has some additional uh, e effects. It increases susceptibility to other NRTIs. It affects the catalytic function of the RT, enhances the fidelity of HABRT. And in clinical studies from the Antonella Castañas group and Adriano Lazzarin, in patients with uh, m 4 v uh, resist uh, m 4 v uh, maintenance of 3TC had actually a clinical, a clinical uh, benefit and reduced uh, clinical complications. So maintaining 3TC in the presence of m 4 v still can confer important uh, clinical benefits to the patient. So the jury is, is still out. And we look at the, uh, so we need to solve the m 184 v question. Another reason for that is actually limiting our use of the dolutegravir 3TC in as uh, first line in, 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 in the clinic is also this data that people with lower uh, C4, less than, uh, C4 counts for less than 200 uh, had uh, lower rates of, of success. That was all, the only sub-analysis that became different in the Gemini 1 and 2. There are explanations for this and they are summarized here and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, all these make sense but nevertheless uh, these really mandate uh, some additional studies in people with low uh, C4 counts be before we can just, uh, you know, accept that these two patient, types of patients are the same. As Jonathan was suggesting, people with low C4 counts continuously appear as, as, as people who are more likely to fail when we reduce the genetic barrier. So this is an important area to be, to be solved. And a, a third aspect is whether if we expose these early treated patients to dual therapies, we might be affecting or not the reservoir or we might be compromising their options for future potentially curative agents. And this is also something that is really present in the clinics, at least in, 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 in Europe. And the data we have so far is that at least time to target non-detected is really comparable in, in, in both groups. Whether that really tells you what is going on in the reservoir, I I am a little bit skeptical. This could just be explained by the pure uh, the, uh, dynamics of the INSTIs. But uh, uh, also the jury is still out, and I know that there are studies going on looking at the reservoir and the, and the lymph node, etc., etc. And it might be that two drugs are enough, uh, uh, are just as good as three, but it has not been shown yet. So in summary, uh, the, our main worry is about the Lutegravir and 3DC as first line can be summarized as the presence of m 184 v uh, the reservoir or C force below 200. I'm pretty sure that the reservoir and the C force below 200 will be uh, solved because there are studies that are being uh, done. And uh, of course, before we uh, generalize the uh, uh, 3 dc to everyone, to every naive patient, we need to clarify whether the presence of m 184 v is important or not. It could be perfectly that, that it is not clinically, so because we have, because it's rare, it's infrequent, and, and, and also it, it provides some benefits, but data has to be, has to be generated. Okay, so he lives in a country where still big Tegravir has not, is not available, so he, he also goes, he starts with Tenofovir FTC and Dilutegravir and has an excellent, excellent uh, response. The viral load goes down, becomes undetectable for more than two, for two years, and his CD4 counts were already high, so they continue to go high, but as I was saying, TAF is not available, so take it out of the, of the question. He develops bone and, and, and renal toxicity, so what, what and then, what can you do in, in, in this case? So assume that he had an m 184 v uh, mutation. Would you go for dolutegravir alone? Who would vote for dolutegravir alone? Dolutegravir 3TC? Yes. Uh, the the Runevir boosted monotherapy? The Runevir RAL? I think so all bad options. Pray to the Virgin Mary? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so what we know from the uh, mobility uh, clinical trials is that if you choose, there are different options here. If you choose to shift to a, a, a boosted PI, it's much better to include a 3TC in, 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 in this regimen. Uh, so don't move directly to uh, just monotherapy. Um, also, data from, from Andrea uh, De Lucas from in Italy showed that uh, people switching in different scenarios to, to um, uh, dual and lamivudin based including therapy uh, showed that the presence of M184V in the past was not associated with increased rates of virological failure. However, it was uh, associated with increased uh, rates of blipping. Whether that has a clinical uh, out, uh, impact is, is uncertain, but uh, patients did uh, just as well. And what we really know from studies in Holland and in Spain is that you should never go for dolutegravir monotherapy. I've used this slide many times. I even won a prize for it, so, but this is, a, again, I'm, I'm happy to present it again. This is a guy who had been undetectable for nearly 10 years on uh, an NRTI-based therapy, so low genetic barrier uh, regime, okay? And then he was uh, shifted to dolutary monotherapy and failed like crazy in six months with resistance accumulation and with, a, a, so never in your life use uh, dolutary monotherapy. So in summary, then m for v is the most uh, frequent mutation involved in genetic barrier discussions uh, nowadays in the clinic. It is rare yeah, if we consider it as a spontaneous transmission, but we need to start thinking and maybe the numbers will change, maybe they will go a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher, so we'll see what needs to happen in our communities. Maybe they will not confirm, but we need to keep an eye on them. Up to 30% of new diagnoses in subjects with previous PrEP in New York City had m for v mutations, so it's uh, an area which is very important to, to do surveillance. Dolutegravir and Bictegravir have much higher genetic barrier than Raltegravir or Alvitegravir, and this is, puts them in a very nice position. I don't think they are as high as the boosted PIs. And the proof is that when failure to Dolutegravir monotherapy is associated with Raltegravir-like resistance uh, profiles, because Bictegravir will not be able to be given alone, I think that will save the drug a bit from showing similar resistance profiles, which I think is good. And uh, nowadays, uh, if we consider dolutegravir 3TC as first line, as of today, we need only to provide it in if patients have a wild type virus in more than 200 cells per mil, uh, cubic milliliter, because Gemini 1 and 2 uh, excluded uh, m one for v subjects. There are studies going on in this, in this scenario, which are very, uh, I think, will be very interesting and could actually be favorable, but we still have to, to, to see what happens. As a tree, as a switch, it's likely effective even in the presence of one for v although more data are still needed. And there was only one single case of resistance emergence at failure, I think at the ACTG uh, 5353. So it seems that actually combining the other with 3TC protects uh, from uh, resistance emergence. So uh, thanks to Vincent and Carlo for the slides. And yeah, that, that would be it.